Yo, yo, yo! Welcome to Philosopher's Stones. Tonight I have an episode I've been waiting to pump out. The Hollow Earth. Are you bitches ready to fly to Antarctica or what? Let me know. Um, let's get into this shit, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this is my shit right here. If you know me personally, I've probably talked to you about this before. I believe there's an Earth within our Earth that we cannot get to. Uh, I'll explain maybe why we can't get to it or why we're not allowed to get to it or why it's been erased from our history or whatever the fuck. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, so let's just get right the fuck into it. Um, happy birthday, Logan. So the hollow earth theory. There's so many creation myths and mythological stories and legends that mention a subterranean world underneath our feet. It could be our forgotten world that we've lost touch with, maybe due to our own bullshit, or maybe the inner earth's inhabitants separated themselves from us long ago because us outer world humans are just straight up inferior. Maybe we disgusted them with our barbaric ways. So the crust of the earth is 800 miles thick according to some shit I read in grade school and on record we've only drilled seven and a half miles deep. So what's under all the crust? The center of gravity exists about 400 miles down. Is there a world that exists around the true gravity center of the earth? Geophysicists have said that there are definitely vast oceans that exist under the ground so why couldn't there be a whole other atmosphere? A secret ocean, secret world, secret life, secret people, secret terrestrial beings. Some say there's giants, some say they're the Nordic Aryans. And it even touches back with Hitler and the Nazis. Um, I'm going to get into the Vril Society and all that shit on the next episode because we are going to have a series on this. This is going to be a series. This is just part one. All right, let's go through the first theory I could really find. In the 1680s, English theologian Thomas Burnett published his work called The Sacred Theory of the Earth. He claimed that most of the water on Earth was inside the Earth until Noah's flood in Genesis. After calculating the water on Earth's present surface, he concluded that there isn't enough water to account for Noah's flood. So moving on to Edmund Haley. In 1692, Haley put forth the idea of a hollow Earth consisting of a shell about 500 miles thick, two inner concentric shells, and an innermost core. He suggested that the atmospheres separated these shells and that each shell had its own magnetic pole. Each sphere rotating at a different speed, if that makes sense. Haley proposed this scheme to explain anomalous compass readings. He envisaged each inner region as having an atmosphere and being luminous, possibly inhabited, and speculated that, speculated that escaping gas caused the aurora borealis, if you know what that is. He suggested auroral rays are due to particles which are affected by the magnetic field. The rays parallel to Earth's magnetic field. So that's one of them. These are just the early guys, you know what I'm saying. We're going to get into the cooler shit in a minute. Now John Symes, he believed the Earth's crust was about 500 to 1,000 miles thick and then under would be a duplicate world of the world we know, just like a miniature world inside of our, our world with its own sun and continents and all that shit. I think Symes was the first one of these hollow earthers to say that the entrances to this inner world are at the polar openings, the North and South Pole. Symes generalized his theory beyond just the earth, claiming that the earth, as well as all the celestial orbicular bodies existing in the universe, visible and invisible, which partake in any degree of a planetary nature from the greatest to the smallest, from the sun down to the most minute blazing meteor or falling star, are all constituted in a greater or less degree of a collection of spheres. I know this part sounds fucking boring, but we're about to get into the good shit, I promise. So William Fairfield Warren wrote a book promoting his belief that the original center of mankind once sat at the North Pole. This writing was titled Paradise Found, the Cradle of the Human Race of the North Pole. 
This came out in 1885. In this book, Warren places the Garden of Eden, Atlantis, Mount Meru, Avalon, and Hyperborea all at the North Pole. His theory goes more into the Greek cosmological mapping. So you can read the book if you want to get into that shit. Let's get into the Richard Byrd story. Admiral Richard Evelyn Byrd. Born in 1888, died in 1957. He was an American naval officer and explorer. Popular for his expeditions to the Antarctic. After World War I, Byrd planned flight paths for the Navy. And he had the Medal of Honor. He had two stamps that were made with this fucker's face on it. So he was a real important stand-up guy in this field. His diary was released upon his deathbed. The diary is titled Admiral Richard E. Byrd's Diary. February, March of 1947. The land beyond the poles. The exploration flight over the North Pole. The Inner Earth, My Secret Diary. What a fucking title for a diary. Couldn't you just put my, like, Richard's Diary or Dick's Diary? That's what we should have called it. Dick's Diary. In Dick's Diary is a flight log that explains what happened to him on this expedition. Now here's where the Hollow Earth story gets a little paranormal, abnormal, extraterrestrial, ultra-terrestrial, interterrestrial, whatever the fuck you want to call it. I was going to completely recite the log, but I don't want to take an hour just doing that, so fuck it, we're going to give you a paraphrase of it. So he's entering the area of the North Pole and his compasses start to wobble and shake. Their aircrafts begin to act sluggish and they see mountains beneath them. Things don't seem right and they start to endure more turbulence. Beyond this mountain range they didn't expect to encounter was a valley with a river running through it and they saw green in which there should be no green landscape in this region. The sun is invisible and the light seems different there almost like a surreal lighting. Then they witness a giant elephant type creature below which is then identified as a mammoth followed by more rolling hills of green landscape and their external thermometer raises to 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the radio goes out. Then they can encounter a city and see a disc-shaped spacecraft with a swastika type marking on it. Bird's aircraft is then frozen or held by some cosmic vice grip. The radio crackles and the, the beings from the UFO communicate with a message in a Nordic German accent. Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. <laughs> Bird's craft is completely out of his control and in the North Polian's energy field. So they ascend down and are, and are approached by several men, tall with blonde hair, Fabio-looking motherfuckers. They can see a city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. Bird hears a voice open up and come out. He complies. So here is where Bird's log ends. And I want to add, so these beings that are Nordic looking, Aryan, kind of already you can see where this ties in with the early Nazi bullshit of wanting to prepare for the coming race that Hitler supposedly thought was going to use him as a fucking leader i don't really know so this is where his log ends and the rest of the tale is told by his memory so he's about to be making direct contact with beings from the hollow earth these nordic types that are described time and time again as tall with blonde hair uh you prob there's even uh, other alien abduction stories where people are taken by the nordics or the nords or Ashtar Command, whatever you want to say. So Bird says him and his radio men are greeted cordially. They board a ship with no wheels, and as they get closer to the civilization city, it seems to be made up of some sort of crystal, like crystal buildings. Bird describes the city as some Buck Rogers type shit. <laughs> They're given a warm beverage they don't recognize, but it's delicious. I would never drink it. 
Uh, the host wished for him to accompany them him by himself down this elevator thing. Bird feels like he must comply, so he goes. They go down to the great door, as they call it, and the host tell him to have no fear and that he's to meet the master. Inside the room behind the great door is said to be a beautiful, colorful construction, almost so beautiful it's indescribable. I just described it. Seemed pretty beautiful. The master interrupts Bird's thoughts with a greeting from a warm, rich voice. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. Bird describes the master as an old, wise man. The master explains they let him land safely because he is a noble, known character of the surface world. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. So the master mentions their concerns over the dropping of atomic bombs over Japan. He's like, look, look at us. Uh... Look how much more advanced we are. Um, you know, like, look at y'all up there just dropping bombs, being dickheads. Bird's like, okay, dude, what the fuck does this have to do with me? Why, why am I here? The master stares at him like he's looking deeply into his soul and after a few minutes explains that our race has reached a point of no return and that there are humans who would rather let the world destroy itself than give up the powers they hold. Seems pretty relevant for 2020. Bird agrees, and the master continues telling him how in 1945 they tried to contact Bird's human race, but their ships, the Flugelrods, were fired upon and pursued by our fighter planes. The master continues to say there's a bigger war than the one we just fought, talking about World War II, and that there will be no way for us to stop this coming war. He pretty much says that we will destroy our own world with these atomic weapons, Bird has to come back to his race with the message to stop all the fighting. So, this story kind of relates to a lot of other abduction stories, I'm not going to lie. Their meeting ended there. Bird stood questioning reality for a little bit and was and what was happening and then slightly bowed to the master. Then the two hosts that led him to the master reappeared. The master said goodbye and they left onto an elevator. Upon his return from the North Pole, he said he, we needed defense aircraft in the North Pole, and then he was summoned and detained for over six hours for debriefing in order to remain silent. So he went back and was like, yo, we need to beef up our security. There's these fucking Nordic dudes that have technology way higher than us. We got to do something about it. They detain him for six hours and debrief him. Now, all of these bird tales are subject to speculation, of course, like everything I report on is. A lot of questions about the timeline and all of that. Not going to investigate birds' claims or credibility. I don't have time to do that, and I don't really give a fuck. So, here's another account of his later expedition. In January 1956, Bird led an expedition to the Antarctic and penetrated 2,300 miles beyond the South Pole. This is important because beyond the South Pole is, as far as we know, it's unreachable. So, 2,300 miles into the unreachable. That's kind of where it ends for Bird. Um, I mean, there's a lot of hollow earth stuff that came after bird that we'll get into i'm sure but it's really up to you whether or not you believe bird's story he was a military man he was respected i don't see a reason for him to lie or make up this gigantic fabricated story of him being pulled in to a inner earth Unless he really, 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 really felt like he could be the one to come back to the U.S. or whatever and say, hey, we got to stop all this atomic warfare, all this nuclear warfare. We got to quit or we're going to fucking kill ourselves. But also, I think, why you? Why you, Richard Bird? Were you the most noble man at the time? Were you the most noble candidate that they could find? that they could contact, that they could bring in. I don't know. I wasn't born yet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. We're going to get into this last part. This is about James Forrestal, a legend member of Majestic 12. He was the Secretary of Defense under Truman and Secretary of the Navy for Roosevelt. So another military guy, another well-respected military guy. 
Forrestal was the man who sent the naval task force, including Byrd, to the Antarctic. Supposedly, they advertised the expedition to search for coal deposits, but Forrestal must have known the real reason was the search for the hidden Nazi base called Neuschwabenland. Now, this is another thing that I'm going to get into. A lot of this Hollow Earth stuff relates back to the Nazis, unfortunately. So, while searching for New Schwabenland, we're rolling with some real deep Navy military craft, and we're, we're, we're armed to the T. So, supposedly, we were met with force by the Aryans who live in the Hollow Earth. If it was such a big naval fleet that we were rolling with, and we retreated, then whatever the Aryans had must be pretty powerful, you know? Uh, upon Forrestal's return, it is documented that Forrestal became paranoid and basically he was lightly whistleblowing on what he saw in the North Poles, or in the Poles. He was placed in Bethesda after telling people about the Aryan underground base and it's said he was put through a series of psychiatric treatment, which is abuse in any case in my opinion. You, I mean, it's bullshit. And in 1949, Forrestal hung himself after being forced to be quiet about what he knew. Of course, his suicide is cover up by simply saying he went crazy. So R.I.P. James Forrestal. I'm sorry that you were forced to keep your mouth shut and then you hung yourself. If you even hung yourself. You probably didn't hang yourself. You probably were killed because you knew the truth. Ha <laughs> ha. So there we go. That's the first part of the Hollow Earth. I just wanted to lay that first groundwork in there so you could have an idea of what I'm going to be talking about on the next Hollow Earth episode. We're going to get into Agartha. We're going to get into Shambhala. We're going to get into what the Hindus think and all that. And we're going to go all into it. I've got a bunch of shit. Bunch of shit to report on with the Hollow Earth. This is just kind of entry level shit when you first start looking into the hollow earth this is what you're gonna find first so i figured why not present it all in one video um i'm sorry if it was a little boring actually i'm not i don't give a fuck if you don't want to watch shit about the hollow earth don't fucking click on it ha uh thank you thank you for watching even if you didn't like it um i mean a lot of people nowadays want to entertain the flat earth theory which ties in with the simulation theory. And that's all cool, which I love to entertain too. Not the flat earth stuff, but the simulation stuff. But the hollow earth just seems very, very reasonable that with the geophysicists who have found vast amounts of ocean under the earth's crust, why would there not be some type of world? And I don't know why, it just made sense to me the first time I heard it, it resonated with me. I really could give a shit less if it doesn't resonate with you. So there you go, there you have it. This is Philosopher Stone, thank you, thank you for watching. Stay safe out there, social distance yourself from whatever the fuck, do whatever you do. I stay inside all the time, I really don't give a shit. Uh, I'm fine, I don't talk to anybody in real life anyway. Leave me alone. Ugh.